Good afternoon. I'm uh, General Buck Kernan from the Institute of Land Warfare. I want to welcome you to one of 11 panels we're having here at AUSA. Uh, hopefully these will be very educational, informative, and interactive so that you have an opportunity to dialogue with uh, the presenters and get as much information as possible about the various subject matters that we're going to present over the next three days. A couple of uh, administrative remarks first. There's some forms on the chairs there. One of them is from Army Public Affairs. Uh, they're trying to do a survey to find out the effectiveness of the AUSA conference. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to fill those out and just leave them on the, on the seat upon the completion of the panel, they'll come back and pick them up because Chief of Staff of the Army is trying to find out the value added to these conferences, how we can make them better, and also uh, how important they are in getting the Army's word out uh, to the public. Also, there's a, a card there for questions. Uh, please write out your question, who you'd like that question directed to, and, and, and put your name on it. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Conley, he, uh, those two gentlemen standing over there, raise your hand. Uh, they'll pick them up, and they'll get them to uh, Lieutenant General Cleveland, who make um, a determination as to who's going to answer those questions. We've got a very, very important and I think interesting to topic, you know, special, special operations and its integration with the general purpose forces on how we're going to partner with and dominate not only today but tomorrow's battlefield. We've been very, uh, very, very fortunate over the last 10 years to see tremendous integration and synchronization between the Special Operations Forces as well as the General Purpose Forces. We tore down the old traditional green door, as we used to call it, some years ago in our War on Terror, and that was a tribute to the leaders we have up here, uh, not only the uniform personnel and our coalition brethren, but also in the interagency arena, which made a huge difference on our ability to fight uh, and win on this very dynamic battlefield. It's going to be even more important as we look at things like Homeland Security. SOFT has been on the leading edge of developing tactics, techniques, and procedures that have migrated to the General Purpose Forces. Uh, the effectiveness of our partnership on the battlefield is directly attributable to how leaders coordinate and integrate. Uh, we have a multinational panel, and we're very fortunate also to have Linda Robinson from the, uh, from the Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs Council. Uh, so we've got a very august panel to, uh, to entertain you and to inform you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lieutenant General Charlie Cleveland. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a, uh, a, a very important topic, uh, at least, and, and probably a topic that's been growing in importance. I think as uh, probably at the same time as there is a dawning realization that to be effective, as effective as we need to be, and this isn't about conventional force, this isn't about special operations forces, this is about our army, this is about how we apply as a country land power in what are increasingly complex threat environments. And I think we've, you know, the, the Iraq and Afghanistan have been tremendous battle labs for us. Uh, we've gotten some things right. Uh, we've gotten some things uh, maybe almost right, and we've corrected the records, and we've done some things, frankly, that we realized, okay, let's never do that again. And part of what's happened right now is actually looking back and saying, okay, what is it that we have to, what are the right lessons learned and, uh, and what do we want to carry forward? And as importantly, and you'll hear some of the panelists talk about this today, uh, what do we see out in the future and how are we going to make sure that uh, we don't lose the gains that we've made over this last decade plus of fighting on a very complex and shared battle space. Uh, 
You know, they say the, uh, you get to the Army by way of uh, its stomach, right? Isn't that the old saw? You know, certainly uh, that's the case for, uh, for maneuver units out there. Um, and I had, uh, when I first, uh, I had a, about a 10-month um, extended apprenticeship, let's put it that way, as I was waiting to take command. And uh, I, was, I was in conversation with uh, our center uh, warfare, uh, JFK Center, uh, Special Warfare Center and School Commander, and he said, you know, sir, I, I got to tell you, the way you get at the Army is really through its doctrine. Now, for those of us that are, have spent really a whole career avoiding reading of doctrine, and, uh, and in fact, I, I used to tell the guys, you know, it's easy to think out of the box when you're not sure exactly where the lining of the walls of the box are, okay? So you're not constrained. Um, but what I did was I had an opportunity to act actually start visiting TRADOC's uh, Unified Quest series of exercises. I saw where we were, uh, you know, a piece of that uh, process where we were actually starting to test all of the things that we had learned about supported and supporting relationships, about how civil affairs and MISO operations, uh, what role they play in, this, in the conventional battlefield as well as the soft battlefield and then the mixed battlefield. Uh, the roles that uh, our special uh, logistics organizations that have to tie into theater logistics around the world play. The role that our, our aviation units give us in terms of our ability to do high-end projection uh, through the air. And, and it, what, it, what you realize quickly is that there's a body of knowledge that has to be, we have to contribute to the Army's doctrine. And uh, I, I'm happy to say, and in fact, uh, I think uh, those that have received the, I think they're calling it a, what is it, doctrine in a box, I think is the uh, term. The Army has just put out its doctrine. And for the first time, Special Operations has its own Army doctrinal publication, ADP 3.05. Now, that doesn't seem like much. But for those of us that have spent, you know, 33 years in SF, 34 years in the Army, uh, for special operations to actually have its own place in the doctrinal publications of the Army above the FM is hugely a departure and, in my view, an advance. And so what I'd like to do is first slide. This is just a very, now again, this is not precise, but this lays out really what, for the first time, we have an ADP that is, tells the rest of the world and the Army what our special operations consist of, and it's, it's really two forms of special operations. They're uniquely American in some way, and, and General Page and I, uh, I think, would agree on this, is that you know, the nation has a requirement to uh, help freedom-loving peoples around the world in one way or another. Uh, that stems from our history and coming out of the Cold War, and actually in World War II, the OSS, and that's really our special warfare capability. And if you think about our special warfare capability, it's unconventional warfare. It's these uh, small footprint FID efforts, small footprint COIN efforts. It's the El Salvador of Colombia's of the early 2000s. It's those efforts that uh, special forces, in a low-key way, have been out there working to create capability with friendly uh, friendly nations uh, around the world to help them solve internal problems to those countries. Um, and then we have this other capability that is designed to kill, capture, render safe, do things that need to be rescue hostages around the world. And again, we've built an incredible capability to do that. Together, those are what America's special operations forces are about. And they're distinct in some ways because by the nature of what the requirements are of them. The first is we have to, and I term it in terms of uncertainty, we have to extract as much uncertainty as possible before we execute. So we build an incredible capability to know the intelligence required that enhances the chances for success of that particular mission. We use operators who are specifically trained to do the kinds of things that they need to do when they enter into a circumstances where precision munitions, small arms munitions, precise application of force is critical to mission success. 
A bunch of dead hostages at the end of a rescue is not success. And so that force, that deals with uncertainty by squeezing that uncertainty out and then we execute. The other force is designed to actually wade into uncertainty. You don't know all that you need to know when, you're gonna, when you have to go in and link up with the Northern Alliance. You don't know what you're going to have to say or how you're going to have to act or what kinds of things you have to bring in in order to make them successful. And the nation needs both of those kinds of special operations forces. And I think we've done a pretty good job building both of them. But this gives you a, a sense of this. The tor four top bars are what I would call soft maneuver elements. They close with and destroy the enemy. Just like maneuver elements in the rest of the army. They're combat forces. When they execute what they need to execute, they earn the CIB, just like their infantry brothers down the road. Civil affairs and MISO elements are soft combat support elements. They support our two forms of maneuver plus the general purpose force. And then the last are basically army units that have been highly retooled to support our two forms of maneuver. That's essentially what ADP 305 lays out. It puts a little more science behind it. Next slide. And what I'll do is uh, I'm about ready to turn this over to General Page, but I will tell you what I think is the next horizon for us. And it's not that we've done and we've learned a lot at the tactical level, and I'm talking the BCT level and even to some degree the division level and below when, it's, when you're on a multi-division battlefield. The TTPs of how we work together have become very, very good, and we need to capture those. The challenge for us is that there are now places in the world where what we are doing is we are executing soft campaigns. And so now instead of being a capability that is used, tactical capabilities that are used for strategic effect episodically, we're entering into a period where frankly we're using these special operations capabilities for campaign effects. And it's the, it, the strategy importance is ascribed to the campaign, which is long term. And if you take a look at places around the world that have got conflict in them and where special operations are working, left of the JTF threshold, to me that's the next horizon. And so the body of knowledge that we're seeking to uh, create at USASOC and at SOCOM, frankly, are going to push, I think, more into how do we apply SOF as an operational asset. And uh, again, what's the nature of the soft campaign? And if you think about it, you have to ask yourself the question, where do we send the man or woman, the professional army, or frankly any service, officer, to learn how to write the campaign for a place as complex as Yemen? And that, I think, is the, is the next, next area that we need to go. And that's going to be shared space. It's not going to be only SOCOM's assets. It's going to have to be SOCOM and the Army. The Army has tremendous capability, tremendous assets. The Chiefs move towards regionally aligned forces are going to play central to all of that. Um, but that's the next horizon. And with that, I'll go ahead and we can go back to slide off and I'll turn it over to uh, my friend, Lieutenant General Page. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Lieutenant General Jacko Page, I'm uh, the UK's Commander of Force Development and Training, a relatively new command in the British Army, which um, I would only be <coughs> not wildly misleading, though misleading if I explained it as the UK equivalent to TRADOC, but that's near enough. Uh, I run the Doctrine, the Development, the Future Equipment Programme, and the recruiting and training organization. But I have served in the past with UK Special Forces. And I was asked to give a, a Brit view. I don't know whether that's part of the sort of light entertainment uh, that you get, get a Brit up, um, or whether it's to be uh, controversial, or whether it's to demonstrate uh, shoulder to shoulder that we think exactly alike on these issues though uh, I'll only be slightly wicked uh, by saying um, 
and there's a number of gentlemen here I've known over many years, uh, which rather reinforces the point that very often special forces across different nations are more comfortable with each other than they are with their own conventional general purpose forces um, uh, and uh, are more at home uh, with special forces from allied nations and had more dealings with them than sometimes they do with their own army that they're drawn from. Having said that, I'll say there's a couple of cultural differences in the United Kingdom. The first is that in a sense in the UK there is no such thing as a special forces officer. There are only officers who have served with special forces. Now that's not sophistry. Um, we are not allowed to serve for 10, 15, 20, 30 years unbroken uh, with the soft community and thereby become a cast apart. You, our careers are managed with alternate tours between special forces and serving back with the regiment you came from, you always stay with the regiment you came from, or with staff officer appointments or indeed command appointments in the uh, wider either single service or joint environment. And that, I think, produces a cultural difference. Secondly, our special forces are small, and that leads to two, um, uh, two outcomes. Firstly, a reluctance to take on tasks which should or could be done by general purpose or conventional forces. And secondly, in terms of enablement, there's a requirement to be supported quite early on by uh, the services, the uh, general purpose forces. So it, it, it is less easy in the UK to have a special forces component which is complete unto itself. Uh, then picking up uh, what General Cleveland said about doctrine, I think uh, in terms of the use of special forces in the UK, the approach is, is it would best be pro uh, described as very pragmatic and special forces do not get terribly uptight about who they are working for in terms of chain of command. It really depends on what the theatre, the mission, the task is, whether you are tasked and commanded at a tactical level or whether you're held at a theatre level. It, it will depend. We quite happily can take the same special forces force elements and... Uh, give them for different missions a different command chains. We are absolutely, however, and uh, because of experience, um, we are absolutely hot on the issue of battle space management and understanding at any given time uh, who is responsible for what in order to both be able to deconflict and synchronize and involve uh, and avoid blue on blue. That's in particular important when part of your force elements aren't necessarily dressed to look like their friendly forces. Um, and I think my final point, if I may, in this opening segment is to make the point that in the early 80s, when I had my first exposure to special forces and the central problem uh, was on the central front and certainly uh, from the British Army piece sat on the Rhine, uh, our principal focus was Third Shock Army coming out of Magdeburg. Special forces were very much niche players. Um, had it come to a conflict they might have made the fight go a bit better, but they could never have been claimed to be decisive in their own right. Um, when you look at the scale of forces employed, the millions that would have been deployed on the Central Front, the relative size of the Special Forces piece was quite small. But you probably could fairly ask whether that is as true now as it, as it was particularly if you take the, uh, as, uh, uh, as credible uh, both uh, US and UK doctrine, which is talking about more congested 
and cluttered battlefields where, by and large, not necessarily absolutely, but by and large it is likely that future conflict will take place in complex terrain, in populated terrain, where human, the human population has to be taken into account. It is not, in fact, something that armies, by and large, conventional Western armies, uh, look forward to. Uh, we're about to mark, we're in the process of marking the 70th anniversary of El Alamein, uh, the Western Desert. And a chunk of my army still looks back to that as good warfare, clean warfare. You could manoeuvre unhindered and there were not civilians in the way. Uh, you could bring about uh, double envelopment. You could be decisive. Uh, but the sort of clustered and unsatisfactory conflict that we may well be drawn into in populated areas um, arguably is going to demand all forces to adopt more of the skill sets that in the past were seen as the preserve of special forces. And I suppose I should finally say um, that I've gone through periods where uh, the army has been quite interested in the special forces, but it varies on a campaign by campaign basis. However, as a joint enabler, it has always been my experience that the maritime and air elements have been interested in special forces because they see them as a considerable aid to targeting. And I think notwithstanding uh, evolutions in uh, developments in technology, uh, that will probably remain true. Uh, but I, I am increasingly of the view that in terms of the effectiveness of the, the use of land power, uh, the better we can synchronise, uh, the more effectively we can operate special and general purpose forces, uh, then are, the greater are the chances of us prevailing in future conflict. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to present from here if you could turn this one on. Um, I'm, I'm Major General Tony Arardi, the commander of the 1st Cavalry Division. And uh, my, just a, by way of introduction, I, I served uh, in Afghanistan in the Combined Security Transition Command prior to it becoming NATO, tra uh, NATO training mission Afghanistan in 2008-2009 time frame as the director of programs uh, and then served on the Army staff uh, for the past two years as the Director of Force Management in the Army G3, and I'm privileged and honored to be at Fort Hood with the 1st Cavalry Division. What I would like to do is to talk very briefly about the perspective on this uh, topic from the general purpose force perspective, conventional uh, force perspective. And the first thing I'd like to point out uh, or, or note is that today and in the future, Army forces, including uh, the 1st Cav Division, will be expected to accomplish a tasks across the range of military operations in what the Army has described, prevent, shape, and, and win. Uh, certainly, we're preparing right now in the division to deploy the brigade that conduct security force assistance in Afghanistan. Uh, other forces of the division are training to conduct, um, if, if needed, um, combined arms maneuver, wide area security operations. And we're preparing um, in the future uh, to align our forces uh, according to the Army's um, directives regionally and to uh, support combatant commander requirements in a regional way, enhancing our capabilities uh, to support the COCOMs and effectively uh, operate um, with special operations forces uh, in these regions. The history that uh, that I've seen, that I saw when I was when I was in Afghanistan, and having spoken to several commanders recently, is that over the past decade there has been a very high degree of integration and, and growing interdependence between special operations and conventional forces at the tactical level. I mean that that's where where we are on this right now. Commanders and leaders are on the ground, making it happen uh, to achieve the desired effects, leveraging the capabilities and capacities of each side of the equation 
um, of the soft GPF equation to, to achieve the objectives. And this is, I, I think, continuing to develop uh, and is on a very, very good trajectory, frankly. So from the time back in 2009 when we first stood up the Afghan Public Protection Force in Wardak Province, now to a more robust village support operations regime is, you know, I think somewhat indicative of, of how that's grown. With special operations forces in the lead, enablers being provided by conventional forces, uh, aviation, route clearance, logistics, etc., to help that uh, occur. And so where we are now is after having had this experience from the conventional forces side, is taking what we've learned and as uh, my panel mates will describe, codifying these in, in the institution, bringing it back to us both in the operating force and in the generating force, how we man train and equip our forces to get, to get a higher degree of interdependence to make it more seamless and to achieve not just tactical objectives but, but operational and strategic objectives. So at, at this point I'll turn it over I believe to General Haas for any comments or his comments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Chris Haas. A uh, little bit about my background. I've spent the majority of my career in the special warfare arena in that uncertain environment as a special forces officer. My last assignment before taking com command of U.S. Army Special Forces Command was in Afghanistan as the commander of the Combined Forces Special Operations Component Command, which basically had three lines of operations. Building capabilities and capacity in our Afghan commandos, also working the Afghan local police line of effort, and then being available providing special operations capabilities to the ISAF commander as required. So I, I have, even in my last assignment, spent time working in the special warfare arena. And I think what, what's important to me about, and for officers like me who have worked in the special warfare community and, in, and have seen this maturing, soft, and conventional force partnership and the increasing level of interoperability is that we have moved down into a category of trust and confidence regarding each of our capabilities that didn't exist before. And so it's important for, for me as an Army officer to see this trust and confidence develop into what are now carefully crafted C2 arrangements that exist out there, that supporting and supporting command relationships actually work. And that ownership and direct OPCON, TACON, it no longer carries the day or, and is the major argument of, across the tables with the, the senior leadership and the general officers. And that this will allow us, to certainly in uncertainty in the future, to be able to employ our combined capabilities where it needs to be at the, at the right time. And you know, certainly our, the, the Army and most of us are all very familiar with the surgical strike. And our Army is very comfortable with surgical strike and does a lot of surgical strike. And so when soft enters the battlefield and conducts even more precision surgical strike operations, there's an immediate trust and confidence there. But as I said, what wasn't there was this kind of uncertain environment of unconventional warfare and working with unpredictable host nation forces or unpredictable in indigenous or local forces. <coughs> And through the steady blending of capabilities and the steady partnership and interoperability that has occurred over the last 10 years, we have developed a great deal of respect for each other's capabilities. And I think more important, the, 
the senior leadership within the conventional army and the regular army now understands a great more about what is going on in that special warfare and environment and can look to a group of experienced and seasoned officers in the special forces community and the special warfare community that can command and control operations in this environment. And then it, he has the, a better understanding and, and certainly the, a greater amount of trust and confidence in those organizations that are out there doing this tactical level work and trying to achieve those operational effects for it. <clears throat> so I could go on about the differences in the cultures between uh, the, the special warfare community and, and the rest of the army. But I'll just say now that there is a recognition of that difference in the cultures. And now we have moved beyond that to appreciating them and actually attempting to maximize those for the, for the future. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to my brother. Thanks, sir. My name is uh, Ferdy Rosari. I'm the uh, Deputy Command General at the United States Army JFK Special Warfare Center School. And uh, we have the burden of trying to uh, convert General Cleveland's uh, nightmares and dreams into uh, doctrinal reality. So over the last 10 months, it's been uh, a labor of love, to say the least. Uh, but I'd like to focus on uh, four lines of operations to, uh, that we're working on to get soft conventional force uh, interdependence developed across the Army, uh, primarily focusing on combat training centers, professional military education, doctrine, and experiments. And right now we see that as being done in a two-phase operation. The Special Operations Center of Excellence has broken ground on a new reality, now, a reality in which Special Operations Forces and conventional forces work hand-in-hand -hand to generate the most potent war fighting force possible. The beginning of this reality took shape on the 30th of November, 2011, when the United States Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center School was formally designated as one of the Army's 10 centers of excellence. And I would also include that besides Special Forces, Civil Affairs, and Psychological Operations slash MISO, it includes all the components. In addition, though not subordinate to TRADOC, the Special Warfare Center and School was accredited by TRADOC in August of this year, achieving an Institute of Excellence rating reserved for the top 10% of Army schools. These were the first milestones in formalizing an unprecedented partnership between the Special Operations Forces and Conventional Forces. In order to create leaders across the Army that are competent, capable, and confident in understanding how Special Operations are used and leveraged across the battle space, an introduction to Special Operations must be as fundamental to the professional military education as an understanding of how maneuver, fires, intel, etc., war fighting concepts are used today. As our Army creates an identity in today's complex operating environments, influencing the human domain becomes increasingly important. The specialty of special operations. The battles and conflicts for the foreseeable future will be small in scale and require a finesse that combines a lethal capability with cultural understanding and building partner capacity among our partners. It will be the responsibility of the special operations to share with the whole Army the nuances of special warfare and surgical strike. This will be accomplished in the near term by focusing on professional military education, combat training centers, doctrine development, and experiments and exercises. The Special Operations Center of Excellence is taking a two-phase approach to integrating Army Special Operations education into professional military education. Phase one is to cooperate with centers of excellence across the Army and weave Army Special Operations Forces doctrine into schoolhouses so that instructors at professional military edu education courses will be able to immediately use ready-made instruction in an off-the-shelf configuration. It means that the lesson plans are written and training support materials, instructor notes, checks on learning, practical exercises, are developed and packaged into training support packages at our center and are ready for any installation to migrate into their primary military education courses. 
This also allows the doctrinal experts at, these special, at the Special Operations Center of Excellence to develop Special Operations curriculum for consumption across the Army and to eventually tailor instruction for any particular branch. The primary objective of Phase 1 is to integrate Special Operations doctrinal lesson plans into the curriculum and professional military education of all schoolhouses at all levels, but focusing first primarily on the Captain's Career Course, which will occur in June of 2013, followed by the Basic Officer Leaders Course in August of 2013, and some elements already appearing in the Captain's Career Course pilot that we're conducting at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. In immediate level education, the School of Advanced Military Studies and the Army War College and the non-commissioned officer education system to include advanced leader course and senior leader course and the Army Sergeant Major Academy will follow beginning fiscal year 14. Concurrently, the Special Warfare Center School is developing scenarios and contributing trainers and soldiers to the Joint Readiness Training Center for Polk, Louisiana. Lessons learned at JRTC will then be integrated into curriculum to ensure the most relevant and current tactics are applied throughout the other training centers and professional military education. During the first phase, learning outcomes for each of these professional military education level will inform the design and development of instruction from what we see as being the small kind of hip pocket training, one hour blocks of instruction to entire instructional modules that can be used in ROTC and other institutions. The PME level will have separate lesson plans and training support packages appropriate to the experience level of the students. Simultaneously, the development of these training support packages, the Special Warfare Center School is coordinating with TRADOC and other centers of excellence to collaborate on the strategy to best determine how to integrate special operations curriculum. At the Captain's Career Course level, the Special Warfare Center is working with the School Advanced Leadership and Tactics on developing those lesson plans for Special Operations Doctrine into Com Army Common Corps, Common Corps, excuse me, under the Unified Land Operations Instruction. The Special Warfare Center and School Liaison to Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth has been working with the Combined Arms Center leaders to include Special Operations Instruction and Intermediate Level Education. Additionally, leaders at the Mission Command Center of Excellence have committed to assist the Special Warfare Center School in integrating Special Operations Basic Officer Leader Course Level Education to other centers of excellence through their integrated planning team. Trained developers at the Special Warfare Center School are also collaborating with the Reserve Officer Training Corps and West Point to include Special Operations curriculum and pre-commissioning sources. The end of Phase 1 is a separate universal training support package for each of these professional military education levels, which means, for example, that the Intelligence Center of Excellence receives the same lesson plan for their Captain's Career Course as the Fire Center of Excellence. In Phase 2, which is Center of Excellence centric, the concept further manifests itself when special operations trained developers and instructors have collaborated with the doctrine writers and trained developers and instructors from each of the centers of excellence. With close collaboration with, those, with each center of excellence, the Special Warfare Center School can customize the Army Special Operations lesson plans for each center of excellence or branch school reflecting the unique battlefield relationships between the special operations, the Army Special Operations and any given branch. Special operations scenarios will be added to existing lesson plans, practical exercises, and practical exercises so that students must consider insurgents activity, for example, and the effects of their operations on this activity, as well as leveraging the operational awareness of partner nation forces to accomplish their missions. As Army Special Operations Doctrine or a given branch doctrine changes, the Special Warfare Center School can work in concert with each center of excellence to update lesson plans. Opportunities for instructor exchanges will also benefit both the Special Warfare Center School and we're pursuing that with the different maneuvers with the different centers of excellence. The Center of Excellence gains a subject matter expert to deliver special operations instruction and also to be the resident subject matter expert to mold instruction to fit particular audience. The Special Operations Force will then also gain the needed conventional force perspective and instructors to deliver Army Common Core material taught at the Captain's Career Course at, special Warf at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Excuse me. Finally, the Special Warfare Center School has also established a relationship with the TRADOC Analysis Centers at White Sands and at Leavenworth. At White Sands, track is developed in a regular warfare tactical war game that will help training developers at the Special Warfare Center and throughout the Army develop efficiency and validate Dotland PF improvements through experimentation. Additionally, by the second quarter of fiscal year 2013, the United States 
Special Operations Command will have its silent quest experiment underway. This enduring USASOC internal program will identify, test, and validate Donald PF improvements. This experimentation program will incorporate subject matter experts from all 10 centers of excellence, ensuring perspective from around the Army. When our Army arrives at the point where a lieutenant understands the role of RSOF and how it fits into the overall battle, how Army Special Operations can enhance his or her mission objectives, and how his or her mission objectives can enhance Army Special Operations, we will have a, gen a generation of officers, NCOs, and soldiers better prepared for special operations, conventional force, interdependence. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Robinson. I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and obviously an outsider. Um, I think General Cleveland invited me to be part of the panel to be kind of a skunk at a garden party here. Uh, but I have been out for the last 12 years uh, in various, uh, both with conventional forces and special operations forces uh, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and places like uh, Colombia. So I'd like to just offer a few observations uh, that might um, prompt some further debate and uh, encourage some questions of these uh, great panelists. Uh, my perspective, as has already been said, is SOF has really come out of its shell in this last decade plus. Uh, and I would like to highlight this publication of the Army uh, doctrinal publication uh, 3-05 and encourage everyone interested in this topic to read it because I think for the first time it really provides a lexicon uh, for communicating what SOF does not only within the Army and within the military but even for uh, public audiences. And I would note how far um, the force has come. I was out in Iraq in the early days and deconfliction was the central goal at that point as the soft elements I was embedded with were really concerned about the Marine uh, AO uh, they were operating in uh, being a target of those Marines inadvertently or their uh, Iraqi partners inadvertently becoming targets. So I think the fact that we're having this level of discussion now a decade later is very important. Uh, but I do think it's important to note that frictions and impediments uh, remain. And I would say those uh, do revolve still around the command and control issues. And I think that they're rooted in and can be overcome largely by increasing the understanding uh, of what SOF does. Um, and I, I think that the, the new buzzword now is interdependence. Um, it's been for a long time integration of SOF uh, conventional force operations. Uh, and I think the meaning of, of inter interdependence could be probed a bit more. But whichever term that you use, I think it depends actually in great measure. The progress that we make in soft CF integration will depend very largely on the progress that's made by SOF in some of its own uh, projects and Army in some of its projects. And that, by that I mean SOF has I think as it's road ahead, and General Cleveland noted, uh, the optimization of special warfare is yet to be uh, completed. I think there is a high degree of optimization of the surgical strike capability, uh, and the, uh, what one of the current priorities now is uh, refining special warfare, which includes the operational art and the doctrinal issues. Uh, that they have uh, taken on. I think also that includes the integration of special warfare and surgical strike as appropriate, and that also gets to the unity of command issues, the interests of unity of command issues. And we've had, uh, I think, a breakthrough uh, example in Afghanistan as of this July with the stand-up of the Sojidif. Uh, the Special Operations Joint Task Force Afghanistan uh, in bringing together all of the so-called soft tribes for the first time in 11 years uh, of war there. Uh, on the Army side, the way I see the, the challenge is this tension between having a one-size-fits-all Army uh, that is fungible among all of its assigned tasks and which must remain prepared to fight and win the nation's land wars uh, but it has to figure out how to balance that task with the degree, the desirable degree of tailored forces, specialization, regional alignment, and particularly the habitual relationships. 
And I think that habitual relationships of conventional forces and soft implies a relationship beyond one or two year R4 gen cycles. So I think there's really a, a, a need to dig into what type of habitual relationships are you talking about among which portion of the force and for what uh, degree of time. So I see a future where SOF and CF might go back to their separate corners, uh, but I don't think that's uh, what the leadership is aiming for. And I think if you read the defense strategic guidance, at least my interpretation of it is the future uh, includes a lot of small footprint missions out there that ideally would be performed by combinations of uh, soft and conventional forces. You could divide up those tasks and say, well, in a totally permissive environment, you're going to send the conventional force, uh, keep soft for more of the unconventional warfare. But it seems to me there's just too much out there uh, in a very dynamic world where you get much more from combining these across the range of the FID, SFA, uh, security cooperation, uh, and a range of not just building partner capacity, but operating with partners uh, for a range of missions. I'd also like to make a quick note that we're not done yet in Afghanistan. Uh, we're waiting, obviously, on a presidential election uh, and decisions about the mission, the size of the footprint, and so forth. But to me, this is a very important test bed uh, to try to make some further advances in how soft and conventional forces combine. And potentially, I would argue uh, that this would be a theater in which uh, soft, with its multiple capabilities in the forefront, uh, could argue for having the leadership of that uh, end game effort. So I'll leave it there. Okay, I guess uh, what we'd like to do at this point, we'll kind of entertain a question that we've, we've uh, set up for ourselves at the panel. Then we'll take a quick break and then we'll collect your questions and, uh, and then we'll spend the, the last part of it uh, getting at your questions. And the question that, uh, just to lead part of that and kind of get us in, it actually plays nicely off of what uh, Linda had to say is, uh, a discussion on how does the operating environment necessitate uh, this soft conventional force partnership. Um, I, what I, what I want to do is I, I think it's pretty clear. Okay, that was not very clear. <laughs> okay, I, th I think the environment that we've been operating in in Afghanistan uh, Certainly, we can talk about what the nature of that environment and why it's pushing us together, but I think it's almost self-evident at this point. Uh, what in, instead I'd like to do is kind of take a step back and then maybe we can jump down into that and I'll open it up to my fellow, fellow panelists here, is if we could go to the, uh, the affectionately known Cardona slide there. This is... Uh, and, and this is a little controversial here, and it's, it wasn't meant to be. What it was really meant to be was let's try to figure out uh, what is different about what we've experienced over these last, uh, I would submit, a phenomena that's emerged since Vietnam, frankly, uh, up to present day, but was highlighted particularly in our last uh, two ventures in Iraq and Afghanistan and to some degree also evident in the places that are not are less so in the news that are what we would call left of the JTF threshold. They're places that we're having to operate, but it's not in it's in a cheap emissions environment and uh, but nonetheless we are contesting the enemies of our country in those spaces. And how do you get at making a science of operating in that space? Uh, and I'll, I'll won't go into the idea of the human domain versus land domain. Uh, I think there's going to be, I hope, uh, some further study on the whole notion of is it useful to maybe look at at, a, at making it a domain in and of itself. Um, and we'll we'll go ahead and uh, address that uh, hopefully in, in a few short months as the as the Army and SOCOM and even the Marine Corps take a look at that. Instead, what I want to do is, is just draw the attention to the phenomena about the environment that's caused us, in no small way, to have to figure out how to operate together 
and that I think gets at what I think is a future notion, and that is the seamless or more seamless application of ground combat power uh, across the range of military operations. Because as you look at that chart, if you will think back, when we started OEF, and when we went into Afghanistan, it started as what? As an unconventional warfare effort, correct? <coughs> You know, 5th Special Forces Group went in, linked up with the Northern Alliance. They were very successful in applying, you know, air power and, and uh, organizing the, the Northern Alliance forces. The Taliban crumbled. But it wound up as a, what? A coin effort that still on goes today. So there was a transition that happened. I think the transition's worth studying. I think the nature of the conflict that was left after the UW effort is worth a study. Likewise, if you go to OIF, OIF started as what? As a combined arms maneuver. And where did it wind up? It also wound up as a coin effort. And again, there was a transition. And again, I think that transition is worth studying and making sure that we learn the right lessons from that transition. Now, the model is trying to get at this notion of how do we bring seamlessly because the, the conflicts transition, how do we more seamlessly then apply these assets that are inherent in the Army so that we can overcome some of the problems that happen at both of those transitions? And so that's the nature of what, again, I think trying to get over those transitions, trying to keep and maintain control.